about you, but I had tears in my eyes as I'm singing that. Has he been good to you? And even if, even if he allows suffering to come into our lives, he'll still be good, right? You believe that? I believe that. Let's turn to Luke chapter 5, please. I want to show you another miracle. These have been really ministering to my heart. And this uh, particular mi uh, miracle we're going to look at this morning is, is so fantastic. Even better than what the lady found over in um, the state of Virginia a couple weeks ago. I drove recently through the state of Virginia, so when I read this article, it really resonated with me. Her name was, uh, is Emily Schantz. She was driving a pickup truck. She has two little boys. They're about 9 and 10, somewhere in that age range. And they had had enough of staying inside, so they wanted to go for a little family drive, just the three of them, just to get out and about. So they're not in a hurry. They just want to get out of the house for a few minutes. As she's driving along in a pickup truck, she noticed that the car ahead of her swerved to avoid hitting what she thought was uh, a bag of trash. So she pulled over and asked the boys to get out and pick up the bag of trash. And as she's waiting in the truck, she noticed down in the ditch, there's another bag of trash. So she had them throw that in the back of the truck. And when they got home, uh, she opened up the bags. And there was nearly a million dollars in those bags. <laughs> she did turn it into the authorities, by the way. But it made me want to go get back in my car and drive through Virginia a little bit more. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, yes, miracles. <laughs> I want to show you a fantastic miracle this morning that's even more exciting than finding a million dollars, okay? It happened to a man who was filled with leprosy. And we don't know much about leprosy in our culture. But uh, in other cultures, at least it used to be very real. I'm sure with modern medicine, we're taking care of that slowly but surely. But I, I have a book in my, art, uh, my library that I was reading this week uh, by Paul, Dr. Paul Brand. He's one of the leading uh, researchers in that area these days. And he um, talks a lot about leprosy and how we're finding cures for it and how it can uh, attack the body. So if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Luke chapter 5. This is an important topic, relevant topic, because of what's happening as a result of the COVID virus. A lot of consequences are happening in our culture, a spinoff from the COVID virus. I guess, first of all, the uncertainty of tomorrow. Um, some college students don't know if they're going to even have a college this year, or school teachers not knowing if they're going to have classes. More importantly, there's a lot of sickness and disease and even death. Also, people are losing their jobs as a result of this. So it's a very timely subject uh, we're going to be looking at this passage this morning. But you add to this um, all the anarchy and the civil unrest in our culture. Even this morning, reading places like Portland, what's happening there last night in Seattle, Washington, Cities all over our country seemingly coming apart of the seams. So we're going to see how Jesus uh, handled this difficult situation. In fact, I think it's helpful with all these problems in our culture. And I'm not just addressing COVID, civil unrest, but I'm right down where you live this morning. Are you carrying a heavy burden? That maybe the person next to you, beside you, in front of you, behind you, they, they don't even know you're carrying it, but you've got a real problem. Maybe you've been impacted, loss of job. Maybe someone in your family has sickness and that sort of a thing. As Mike was praying this morning, reminded once again the number of people in our church family who are going through really deep valleys. So I thought it'd be helpful to look at a man who had a major, 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 major problem. And if you'll notice on the verse on the screen here, it says, when God got finished with him, that man was cured immediately. Didn't have to go through rehab, three weeks of this and four weeks of that. But I mean, when Jesus gets finished with him, he's healed just like that. Now, I got to pull over by the side of the road and tell you, uh, your experience may not be my experience when it comes to a miracle. Please understand that. 
That's why he's God and I'm not, and you're not, okay? Oftentimes, miracles are unpredictable. My experience cannot be measured against yours. I remember one day, years and years ago, I tried to think through how long, how many years ago it's been. It's been a number of years ago when we didn't have much money. And we needed a set of tires for our car. And I went up to Finley to a particular tire dealership and asked if they would give me a quote. And they printed out a quote. And I took that quote and I knelt beside my bed that night, just me. And I lifted up that quote to God. And I said, God, we need some tires. I don't have the money. But you know about that. And so I'm going to give this to you. And I went to bed and slept soundly. God had already been at work before I even prayed because the next day I left my office, went to the post office, reached in and opened up a card. And somebody said, Pastor, the Lord has laid this on my heart to give you this. And I got to tell you, it was for about five dollars more than the quote. So I took it from the Lord and said, OK, Lord, you're a God that goes above and beyond. I'm stopping at Dietz Brothers and getting me a chocolate <laughs> milkshake. And I'm going to drink that chocolate milkshake, thick chocolate milkshake while my tires are being mounted. <laughs> That's the kind of God I serve. But if you need tires and you go home and pray tonight, I can't promise you that tomorrow morning you can go to the post office and there will be $5 extra for you to get a Deets Brothers. I can't promise you that, okay? I'm just telling you that I've seen God work immediately. But some of you have been praying for your problems and it's not been resolved yet. So I just wanted to put that out there before we go any further and not let you get disappointed. What's important is not necessarily the miracle. What's important is that God's mission be accomplished on this earth. And if God wants his mission to be accomplished on this earth, he can do whatever's necessary. Matter of fact, that's why tears came to my eyes at this point. We're singing these choruses up here. It talks basically about how big God is. He's God over everything. And I don't know if you remember that one part we were singing. I had to write it down. And remember, he said, I will wait because sometimes miracles take time. And while I'm waiting, I will worship you, Right? So that's what I wanted to put out there this morning. Now, what we're going to see in our story is very simple. If in your mind you can imagine this, it'll help you as we go into this paragraph here. Just, just think of a fence in the backyard. And on one side of the fence, you're going to see a gentleman display extreme submission to God. You can't get any lower than this man went. As a matter of fact, I've compared Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are the three Gospels that tell us about this incident. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And they come at this same miracle from their unique perspective. Matthew says that this leper worshipped God. I think he just fell flat on his face. Mark says he got on his knees. Well, let's see what happens here in the book of Luke. Luke says in chapter 5, and where is it, verse 12, it came to pass in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, seeing Jesus, fell on his face. And that shows me that this man exercised extreme submission to God. He goes on to say, Lord, I know you can do this. And can I just tell you, this has challenged me in my prayer life this week. Lord, I know you can do You have the ability but is it your will for my life? And the emphasis here, the way this is worded in verse 12 is, if thou, he says, Lord, if thou wilt, I know you can make me clean. And so, Lord, that's how I'm going to end my prayer today. I've asked you, but just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. And evidently, it was in the plan of God. It was in the will of God. And so God touched him. Put forth his hand and he touched him. By the way, that's the other side of the fence. Not just extreme submission, which is quite a character quality that we need to develop in our lives. But the other side of the fence is extreme compassion. Here's the purest man who's ever lived. His name is Jesus. There was not even a, a single ounce of sin in Jesus' life. And he comes to the worst man on earth because Luke's gospel says he was filled with leprosy. Now, one of the things these experts will tell you, like Dr. Paul Brand, is that sometimes leprosy to get full like this, to de destroy every part of your body, takes about nine years from start to finish. 
And it may just show up as just a little spot on your forehead. Some discoloration. It turns all different shades of color. Then it turns black and there's nodules and there's just weird stuff starting to happen to your body. And over the years, I mean extreme stuff like your fingers can fall off. Toes can fall. There's just numbness. That's the nature of leprosy. And it's a highly communicable disease. Okay? We're, in our culture now, we're, some of us are wearing masks because of COVID-19. I went back and saw that leprosy was a virus that just spread rapidly. And so back in Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, there were conditions... The priest would look you over and say, this is your particular kind of leprosy. And if you were deemed a leper, you had to stay away from cities. You couldn't go into a city. Stay over in the corner somewhere at the gate. And if someone came in your direction, in fact, some of the rabbis said if you're upwind, you had to be like 100 feet away. If you're downwind, you're six feet away. But they had to cup their hands and scream out, unclean, unclean. Let me just go back for a minute and let me show you how Matthew developed this. And I'm going to show you how Mark and then Luke, and we'll get to our text here in Luke's gospel. But I found this interesting this week. Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount. And the Bible says in chapter 7 that when Jesus finished preaching that sermon, the people were astonished. They were amazed at his authority because he didn't teach like the rabbis and the scribes taught. I mean, when he spoke, it was a divine word from heaven, and they, they, they got, they sat up and they paid attention. And when he finished that sermon, you turn the page and come to Matthew 8, and the very first miracle that Matthew presents is this miracle. As if to say, not only were the people astonished by the message of Jesus, now people sit up and pay attention because that message is validated by what Jesus actually does with his miracles. Then I looked at Mark's gospel. Very interesting the way Mark presented it. Because it says that Jesus got up long before it was day. I wish he would have put the time there, but he didn't. But imagine, it's long before day and Jesus got up. He went to pray. I personally believe Jesus understood I had so much to do that day. I got to be fresh with God. To give out, you got to pour in first. I think that's why he got up early in the morning to pray. But then it says Peter got up. He must have rubbed his eyes and said, where's Jesus? Because if you look at the context, Jesus' ministry was exploding. He was well-liked. People flocked to him. And Peter says, where's Jesus? I'll go find him. And it even says he took other men with him. This search committee. Some of you guys like to go hunting, right? Well, Peter took some of the other disciples. They went to hunt Jesus. And you can't help but think that maybe they found him at prayer. And maybe they even had the audacity to interrupt his prayer. Maybe Peter said something like, Hey, Lord, didn't you know that you're pretty popular right now? Let's go down to the local newspaper and let's do an interview for the courier. You're so popular. As a matter of fact, Lord, when we get finished with that, let's go on Good Morning Capernaum and, and let's have you interview on live national television. But Jesus understood that's not what I'm about. I didn't come here to please people. I came to do the will of my Father. Peter, would you mind if I finished praying? I believe Jesus was going to preach the Sermon on the Mount that day and needed to spend time, quality time with his Father. I believe he was going to heal people that day, needed to spend time. I believe he was going to invest himself in the lives of others, and so he spent quality time, first of all, with his Lord. That's the way Mark presents it. Now when we come to Luke's gospel, Luke seems to emphasize the fact that he was full of leprosy. Think about that. For nine years, he could never hold the hand of his wife. I would really miss that personally. My wife and I like to go for walks. And beyond just going for a walk, we hold hands. I would miss that. Never could embrace one of his children or grandchildren. I don't know how old he was. It doesn't tell us. But just think about that. Just pause for a minute and think about the complications when you contract leprosy. 
This article I read said it's the most offensive, annoying, destructive, dangerous disease. And the virus pervades the whole body. It kind of works from the inside out, has a numbing effect. And after a while, people do stupid stuff and they don't even know it. They can drive a nail right through their finger and not even know they did it. They can drive a thorn right through their foot and not even know it happened. Do you wonder why people in our country seemingly are doing stupid stuff and they're past feeling? The thing of it is, is that leprosy always in Scripture is a euphemism. It's a picture of man's sin. It starts small but progresses. And see, the world paints sin as pleasant and inviting. And you wish they would show the other side of the coin, right? So that's where this man's at. He's, he's full of leprosy, so he's been around the block now nine years. I personally think he just listened to the Sermon on the Mount. I think he was in tune when Jesus said, straight is the gate, narrow is the way, few there be that find it. And I think he was listening intently. And as soon as Jesus finished that sermon, he went to Jesus Collapsed in front of him, said, Lord, I know you can. That's not the issue. Your ability is not the issue. Here's my prayer request. If you're willing, would you please cleanse me? By the way, in Scripture, leprosy is never referred to as being cured. Always referred to as being cleansed. Let's see how Luke put it here. Again, chapter 5. Verse 13, he put forth his hand. He touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately... The leprosy departed from him. He was cleansed. Do you see the word clean at the end of verse 12? It's kind of like a watch. Years ago when they didn't have the electronic watches like we have nowadays. If your hand wasn't working properly on the watch, probably wasn't the hand. The watchmaker would have to take the back off and dig down into the watch before he found the problem. That's the nature of sin. It's deeper than the skin. It spreads rapidly, and it'll bring you to the place of total isolation if you're not careful. Years ago, when I was a freshman in college, I was just a new believer. I think I had a night course. Because I remember running from one end of campus back to my dorm room. Had a little cassette player that I would push record, and then I'd run back to class. Because for about 30 minutes, there was a radio speaker that I dearly admired as a young Christian. And I listened to him as often as I could. Chuck Swindoll, have you ever heard of him? He made a statement years ago that went like an arrow into my heart. And I just can't get it out of my heart. It's very real. And the statement goes like this. We're all faced with a series of great opportunities that are brilliantly disguised as an impossible situation. I want to ask the person carrying a burden this morning. Can you think with me long range? You may be carrying the very thing that God's going to turn around and he's going to make an absolute blessing out of that situation. Let me look at the leper with you very quickly. One side of the fence, extreme submission. You can't get any lower. The other side of the fence, there's extreme compassion. And boy, when these two things meet together, there is extreme power on your hands. He was a man that was full of leprosy. A classic picture of your sin and my sin. Here's how it starts. Number one, it starts by simply disfiguring the body. Sin starts very lightly. I was thinking about David this week. David up on the rooftop and looks down and sees Bathsheba. All sort of thoughts start running through his mind. Sin is so tantalizing. It's so inviting. But if David could see the end of his life and what that sin brought, he may have chose differently up front. But it just starts out by disfiguring us. And then it begins to go to the next level of deterioration. It causes you to stay at a distance and cup your hands and say unclean. And if it's not dealt with, the wages of sin is death. 
And so that's why oftentimes in Scripture, God will use leprosy to remind us of the nature of our sin and how it needs to be brought to the cross of Jesus Christ for cleansing and for total forgiveness. Now here's what I notice about the man. He not only had this undeniable problem, and if I ask you this morning, are you carrying a weight? You think about it long enough, brings tears to your eyes. What do you do with it? Well, this man shows us from the text of Scripture here what unconditional faith really looks like. That you could list a number of things that you may be facing this morning. You may be going through what your burden is, what my burden is. But this man, one thing about him is he was absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God. Matter of fact, my translation says he called him Lord. I happen to think he believed Jesus was the Son of God. He knew that Jesus could do whatever he wanted to do. That's why he asked him, Lord, if it's your will, I'd like to be cleansed after nine years of this leprosy. And so that's why he asked Jesus this question. Lord, would you cleanse me? Actually, this picture I'm putting up here on the PowerPoint this morning doesn't do justice. I believe what this man had. But I want you to see in his eyes, he's looking upward to Jesus totally submissive and surrender to the will of God for his life. Lord, I know you can do it, but my faith comes to you this morning, and I'm asking you, would you cleanse me? Would you touch me and give me some relief? The first thing I noticed about this man is he has initiative enough to come to Jesus. I like what Mike prayed this morning, that it's there, the gift is there. Matter of fact, it's so simple. How many in our world did they turn away from the simplicity of the gospel that's in Jesus Christ? Not this man. I believe the Holy Spirit of conviction was working in his heart. And he said, before Jesus leaves Capernaum, I'm going to get to him. I'm going to ask him to cleanse me on the inside and on the out. And Jesus did just that. But it shows initiative. It shows he was listening, following the reason of Jesus' sermon up on the mount. I wonder this morning, do you have initiative to come to Jesus? To look around you and see what's really important. And to put aside everything that's not important and come running to Jesus. Do you have initiative to look ahead and see what's, what's coming in the future? You know, we're called to do that in the book of Proverbs. Solomon, who wrote this, was the wisest man who ever lived on the face of the earth besides Jesus. And he said in Proverbs 22, verse 3, that a prudent man, a wise man, can foresee evil, and then he hides himself. But the simple, that's the one who's not thinking. Just glibly going through life, life as it comes, the simple pass on and they're punished. God wants us to have initiative, to look ahead, look around us, to have discernment and to see what's important, and if it's not important, it's not going to be a part of my life. This man said, I'm going to run to Jesus, and I'm going to build my life on the rock of his word. Because as Jesus finished this sermon, that's the closing illustration. He said, a foolish man will build his house on sinking sand, but a wise man builds his house on the rock. And when the winds come and the rains descend and the flood comes along, that man who built his house on a rock is still standing at the end of the day. So I'm just trying to put myself in the sandals of this leprous man. Am I recognizing and acting on what needs to be done before I'm asked to do it? That is the definition of initiative. Number two, this man shows humility. Now, you're sitting here this morning. You say, Pastor Kellogg, I'm in church. Obviously, I'm a man who's humbled myself, and I know about humility. Could, could I challenge you on that this morning? How many people are ruining their personal lives because they've never humbled themselves under the mighty hand of God? I'd like to walk you through this, if you don't mind. I read an article this week, Keys to Avoiding Rebellion in the Life of Your Child. People who have been in Bible-believing church for years lose their children. How does that happen? If I'm a father this morning, I'd sit up and pay attention and ask myself this question, am I truly a humble man? There was a survey that was taken. They asked children, teenagers, if you could change one thing about your parents, what would you change? And the three things that kept coming to the surface in this survey are what the teens said. 
Number one, I wish my parents, when they were wrong, wish they would admit it. A little convicting, isn't it? Because you know what pride is? Pride is an unwillingness to admit I was wrong. And dads, if you live with pride long enough, you're always justifying your bad behavior. Your children in the back seat watch that. They pick up on that. They hear you saying one thing and watch you live a different way. Second thing they said is I wish they would learn to control their temper. I know this is an ouchy subject, but we need to check ourselves this morning, ask ourselves, how humble are we? This man was willing to hit pay dirt. He got on his face before God and said, God, I want you to understand, I'm as low as I can go. I'm submitting to your will for my life. And I'll tell you what, when God saves you and gets you up off your knees, you ought to live this way. Admit when you're wrong. And learn to control your temper. And number three, learn to keep your promises. This survey I read, this article said that in many cases, this is why some parents lose their children. Ouch, that really hurts. When we fail in these areas, our children are wounded. And so they express their anger through rebellion. So number one, he had initiative. Number two, he had humility. But the third thing I saw about this leprous man in the final stages of his life, he was full of leprosy. I found that he shows extreme submission to the Lord. You know, the Bible repeatedly says that God is, his eyes are going back and forth throughout the whole earth. And he's looking for someone who will trust him. And that's demonstrated by the way we pledge our allegiance to him in submission. He promises to reward those individuals who are willing to submit to his authority. And by the way, when this is found in the New Testament, oftentimes it's found at the end of Paul's little epistles. That means he's given us, at this point, application. He's given us the doctrine up front, and at the end of his epistles he gives application. And he says in chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians, for example, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Remember that? Verse 2 says, honor means respect mom and dad which is the first commandment with promise, so that it may be well with you. I believe if a child learns to submit to parents at home, this is just a general principle here, a rule of thumb. When they go to school, go to college, go get that first job, they will have learned submission to their parents so that they can demonstrate that in every walk of life. I think that's what this means, that things will go well with you. Second thing he said in Ephesians chapter 6, is you'll have a long life. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mom and dad, so that you may live long on the earth. And Colossians, when you compare Scripture with Scripture, says it'll bring you great delight. Children, I would say to pay attention to this point. Are you truly humble? That's demonstrated by the way you relate to your parents. So, I found this man was... Filled with leprosy, a problem that maybe you can relate to. Not a minor problem, but a major problem. And he came to Jesus with this undeniable problem, demonstrating unconditional faith, and he had an unstoppable witness. Let's read the rest of this text here. Verse 13 says, he put forth his hand and he touched him and he said, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And Jesus, my translation says, he charged him. That word means he commanded him and said, don't tell anybody. Now, why would, that's an interesting thing to do, right? When Jesus cleansed him immediately, he says, by the way, don't tell anybody. I don't know about you, but I kind of scratch my head when I read that. Because that's the natural, normal thing to do. Tell everybody. But there's a good reason why Jesus asked him not to do it. Matter of fact, if you want to look up at chapter 4, verse 43, it's not too far away. One of the reasons Jesus asked him not to tell people is because he said, I've got to preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. In Capernaum, that area where this took place, one writer said there must have been about 149, 150 small communities. I think Jesus wanted to go from one to one to one to one and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell, call men to repent and put their faith and trust in Jesus and him alone. But when this man did what he did, did, it's almost like Jesus' hands were handcuffed. 
Because now people are going to come out of the woodwork and say, you want a quick fix? Want your leprosy cleansed? And so Jesus didn't need all the attention that this world affords. He was just always about doing the will of his heavenly father. But I still find this man was an unstoppable witness. Jesus told this man, go show yourself to the priest and offer for cleansing according to the Mosaic law. Commanded for a testimony unto them. And we'll get to that in just a moment. An unstoppable witness. How unstoppable are you? He comes to Jesus. And Jesus says, I want you to go to the priest. Because those are the men that I want to put on notice that I'm still God, even though you wrote me off recently. Now, think about the context. We're early in the book of Luke. You go over to John's gospel, and Jesus cleansed the temple, did he not? How do you think the priest liked it when Jesus cleansed the temple? Well, now we're about 70 miles, maybe 80 miles up north at Capernaum. And this man not only was instantly healed, he was given energy because he had to walk all the way down 80 miles and show himself to the priest. And i got to tell you, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall. When this former leper shows up at the temple and says, excuse me, I'm here to get my certificate. That's in the Mosaic Law, chapters 13 and 14, the Leviticus. You go down to the priest, you show yourself, they diagnose you and they come to the conclusion... You're legit. You really are cleansed. He may have had his mom and dad there too. I don't know because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And they gave evidence. Yes, this is my son. And yes, he had the full nine yards. And yes, he has been cleansed. I want to go into this a little bit because it's so instructive about what salvation really is. Now, understand that in Leviticus 13 and 14, those are lengthy passages In the 13th chapter, it gives you all the things that the the priests were to do to identify what particular type of leprosy are we talking about. Chapter 14, how that leper can be cleansed. You know, the Bible said that the leper was to bring these items to the priest, which are so instructive and teach us so much about salvation. Because let's face it, leprosy is heinous, just like sin. But he was to bring, you see that middle wood there? That's called cedar. He was to bring a piece of cedar. If you know anything about the cedar tree, it's the tallest tree in the land of Israel. Your pride needs to be cut down. I think that's what that represents. All this is really representative of salvation, what's involved in it. He was, you see that one on the right there, the hyssop branch? That's the shortest bush, which speaks of humility. And you see what separates it there, that piece of scarlet? Scarlet is that bright color. And uh, my Bible says that uh, though your sin be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. It gets your attention. This man had leprosy. Got everybody. Got his own attention. I can't function properly with this. You bring those three things. And then you bring two birds. And what do you do with the two birds? Well, over running water, the priest would go outside the camp. Just like Jesus went outside the camp, according to the book of Hebrews, and died for us on that cross. And you take those two birds, and you dip them in a vessel of, full of water. After the one bird was killed, the blood would be put in that water, and then the living bird would have the blood put on him. And as he's flying away, can you just picture this? I think that's why Jesus did this, where the Bible puts it this way. As that bird is covered with blood flies away, it's a picture Of what Jesus does when he cleanses us of our sin. Now one bird has to die. Jesus had to die. But the other bird is saturated. With that life of the dead bird. And it's set fully free to fly away. This man went down to Jerusalem. Showed himself to those unbelieving priests. That's the witness that Jesus wanted in his particular day. What did he do instead? The Bible says he went out and started telling everybody. Look at verse 15. He did it so much the more that went out of fame abroad of Jesus and great multitudes came together to hear him and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Fascinating, isn't it? Jesus told this man not to do it. He went out and told everybody. We're told to do it and how many people do we tell? I read an article this week in World Magazine that over in Japan with the COVID virus taking place. 
they wanted to shut down all the amusement parks. And they've got some of the tallest rides in the world over there in Japan. And the owners of one particular amusement park didn't want to shut down. So they masked up. The two men that owned this huge amusement park got on a roller coaster that's got like a 180-foot drop, which is a long way down. Wouldn't you agree? And they're sitting by themselves on the front car of this roller coaster. And this thing goes to 80 miles down. Uh, I'm sorry, 180 feet down, 80 miles per hour. That's what it is. And they've got white masks on. They're, 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 this picture I saw, their fists, their knuckles were like this. And they wanted to show the people at the bottom, you don't have to scream when you're on a roller coaster. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm at the top of one of those roller coasters like that, and I've got a mask. On. I'd be doing nothing but screaming. This man, nine years, possibly had the dreaded disease of leprosy, fell at Jesus' feet, said, I know you can do it. Would you do it? And Jesus put forth his hand and immediately touched the leper, and his leprosy was cleansed just like that. He started broadcasting it all over the place. I'm sorry, I can't help it. I've got to tell somebody about it. It's a wonderful, wonderful picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us through his death, burial, resurrection. Very quickly, let's see how Jesus handles the situation on the other side of the fence. Compassion. You know what compassion is? Very simple. It's the willingness to invest whatever is necessary in the life of somebody else. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My mother-in-law, the other day, I was down there helping her put her house back together. She was helping so much that she had tremendous back problems. And we kept telling her, you sit down. We got this. We'll take care of this. But she'd be right in the middle of something. Oh, well, you sit down. We got this. We all sat down together one night, and her back was really in a lot of pain. My wife and I went and got her something so she could put in her seat. They sell at the drugstore there. And gave it to her to try to help her be relieved of that back problem. It's just a natural thing to want to do. Jesus was filled with compassion. And notice the Bible says he reached forth his hand and he touched him. Two worlds colliding. The man with the disease filled with leprosy and the purest man who's ever walked the face of the earth. He touched him. How about you this morning? Are you a person of compassion? Sometimes we learn by knowing what the opposite is. And the opposite of compassion is indifference. Which translated means we really don't care about the people that we're around. I'm thankful Jesus had compassion on him. And Jesus spoke into his world. He said, I will. I want to give you some hope. I will. The Bible talks a lot, a lot about the impact of our words, mom and dad. As a matter of fact, what you say to your children can either inspire them or discourage them. There's several of these verses. I'm just going to put this one up. But Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And if you understand that and you love that, you're going to experience the fruit of that. But again, if you want to criticize and complain and put your children down, don't be surprised if they act out in rebellion. Just trying to be practical this morning. Jesus had compassion on him. He communicated the word to him. And then he reached out and touched him and showed tremendous power. What struck me about this is that he did it immediately. I suspect if I got healed today, I'd have to go to 25 specialists before I came through something like that. But there's no drawn-out rehab here. No probation period. It's just a complete and immediate cure. We live in very, very difficult times. I read about a lady that came home in southern Illinois this week. Southern Chicago, rather. I believe the city was called Calumet just next door to the Indiana border, almost into Indiana. But she came home and she saw a group of kids playing in her driveway. But as she got closer, she noticed that they all had handguns. And they physically, literally, they carjacked her. They stole her car. And she says, now I'm afraid to get out of my house. You know what sin is doing to this country, our culture? The same thing that leprosy is doing to an individual like this man we looked at this morning. But as I close, I want to give you some good news. Christ came and took this leper's place. If you read the text carefully, Jesus now goes out into the wilderness 
to avoid all these crowds. And that's where the leper should have been out in the wilderness. But he did whatever is necessary to get. He even broke rules and regulations to get to Jesus. He wasn't supposed to be in that close of proximity. But you do the same thing. I'd do the same thing if I traded places with him. He broke all the rules, fell at Jesus' feet and said, Master, Lord, sovereign Savior, if you can, I know you can. But if you will, that's the issue. Will you heal me? Jesus had compassion, touched him, and immediately he was cleansed. I wonder this morning, anybody here that needs to be spiritually cleansed of your sin? You've come to the right place. And before you leave this morning, the Holy Spirit's been showing you that you are indeed a sinner. You've never repented of that sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Before you leave today, would you please get a hold of me? I'd like for God to do for you what he's done to me. What he's done for this leper. He can do for you. Well, Father, a very simple miracle in front of us this morning. A supernatural event that took place in the natural realm apart from natural causes for the purpose of glorifying our Lord and Savior Jesus. There's nothing like it in all the world. And I'm encouraged because what you did for this man, you did for me. Spiritually speaking, you cleansed me. Of my sin. I, I praise you for that. Now someone had to pay the price. And I thank you that your son Jesus went to Calvary. And paid my sin price. And I'm thankful that he rose again. So that he can now give me eternal life. I'm praying this morning Father. That there's someone here who's never trusted him for salvation. They would see the simplicity of the gospel. Once again. and Learn to repent and say yes to Jesus. And begin to follow him. For the believer here this morning. Carrying a very heavy weight. I mean, it's very real to them. I pray that you'd help them take advantage of this opportunity to come down to the altar. And lay that burden once again at your feet. And watch you step in, in your time, in your way. And work a miracle. Just for them. How we love you, how we need you in our culture now more than ever before. So we just tell you we love you and want to praise you. And ask now you'd bless as we... Sing this little invitation uh, chorus together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand together with me? Let's sing this little chorus together.
Señor.